Lovely. Thank you. The music was very nice there, but uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I just, uh, my name's Derek Armstrong, for those who don't know me. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research, Innovation and International here at the University of South Pacific, and it's my pleasure this evening um, to welcome everybody here tonight um, for the very first of our 50th anniversary uh, research lectures. Uh, obviously, it's a very specially, special um, occasion for the university, our 50th anniversary, and it's also a very special occasion for um, the uh, staff and uh, students and everybody associated with the university. And the opportunity to celebrate uh, our research endeavors and activities and contribution and the work of our uh, leading researchers across the university uh, is, uh, is a wonderful one um, for us to, to be engaged in. And this is the very first of our lectures tonight and shortly you'll hear more about that from uh, my colleague, Professor Jita Vanualai, who's the director of the research office. But uh, uh, I just want to say that uh, not only are we pleased to be hosting this event um, and to hear uh, Professor, Professor Sirico tonight, um, it's also, I say, the opportunity to celebrate and to inform people about the research that goes on in the university. The, the, uh, the amount of research is increasing dramatically in the university. The, research, the university is becoming very research focused in its activities, and rightly so, because the contribution of research to the Pacific region is of is a critical, uh, critical importance. It's research that informs policy, it's research that informs interventions, it's research that informs all sorts of activities and developments for governments, for non-government organizations, for the private sector, and I think for the, also for the broader uh, enhancement and social well-being and economic well-being of the, of the region. And the university is very proud to uh, have played and be playing a major role and contribution in that respect. But tonight, uh, tonight is to hear the opportunity to hear um, in some more detail about one of the really significant projects that's going on in the university, funded by the university itself. And uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, prof uh, Professor uh, Jito Vanualai, who is going to tell us more about the lecture tonight and introduce our speaker. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Armstrong. Uh, my role today is to talk a little bit about uh, our main presenter, my colleague, uh, Professor Sirorico, and uh, introduce him to you all. So without further ado, Professor Sirorico is the um, head of the School of Marine Studies at uh, USP. He is an expert on marine evolutionary biology with 30 years of experience in the field. He has attracted over 4.5 million euros in 15 scientific projects as principal investigator and has participated in another 14 projects as co-investigator. He has published 80 scientific papers in international peer-reviewed journals, most of them in the first quarter, ISI journals, which means they are in the A and A star uh, ranked, uh, ranked journals, which collectively have been cited over 3,650 times with an H index of 35 and a 10 index of 55. The higher the index, it may, implies that the researcher is very active in his or her field. Now, he's, the, he's a member of the editorial board of Molecular Ecology 
and scientific reports. He has supervised the thesis of 20 postgraduate students, 12 PhDs, and eight uh, MSCs. His long-term scientific mission is twofold. First, to understand the mechanisms responsible for the generation and maintenance of biodiversity. And second, to promote the understanding of the consequences of the ecology and microevolutionary processes affecting living organisms and their implications in the conservation of natural renewable resources. His research mission is focused on evolutionary and conservation questions rather than on a particular ecosystem or organism. Professor Sidorico regards species, populations, and ecosystems as models to address consequential questions in ecology, evolution, and conservation with an aim to integrate these disciplines for the sustainable management of marine, wild, and mariculture resources. And without further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Sirurico, who will talk about this amazing research that shows that Fiji is a wonderful place uh, where the sharks find life salvation. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Chito. Thank you very much, Eric, for the, uh, Derek, for the presentation. And uh, thank you very much for all of you, to all of you for being uh, this evening here to share with us uh, some of the findings of a research program, more than a research project, I like to call it as a research program because it involves uh, different uh, independent research projects all related to coastal shark conservation. and. Uh, biology and ecology, understanding shark populations in Fiji. Not only one species, the first project was uh, on hammerheads. Uh, can we have, please, the, uh, the title slide uh, to begin with? No, that's uh, already way down. Um, that one, can we put it on the presentation? Um, so I call it, uh, well, Actually, it was Chito who, who called it uh, that way. I sent a more scientific title, but he thought that something more appealing for the general public was appropriate. Thank you very much. And it's endangered hammered hares and vulnerable bull sharks, because they are, these are the two main focal species, but we have also studied others, find life and sanctuary in Fiji. And uh, this is the combined uh, effort of uh, a number of people that involves uh, a postdoctoral fellow, Amandine Marine, uh, master's students and uh, PhD students, Tom Bierus and Celso Kawik, uh, completed their master's degrees within the project. Kerstin Glaus is at the moment uh, conducting her PhD studies in the school, and also a number of faculty members that have collaborated with us. Cara Miller is now in uh, New England uh, University in Australia. Unfortunately, she left just over a year ago. Susana Piovano is fortunately still among us, and she's a, a senior lecturer in the School of Marine Studies. But we also have collaborators from uh, the University of Bremen and from the uh, Leibniz Center for Tropical Ecology, also in Bremen in Germany, Stephen Gehrig, Duke Boschenweiler, and Martin Simmer, which is a professor at that institute. Um, we also have participants uh, helping a lot from Projects Abroad, which is a uh, voluntary-based program uh, in Fiji. It's, uh, the actual Projects Abroad is uh, an NGO based in London, it's, it's English, but they have a base here in Fiji, and they conduct a number of projects from volunteers. And they collaborated extensively with us uh, still currently today in uh, Kirsten Glau thesis, but on the Hammerhead Shark project as well. And Frontier, which is another very similar uh, NGO uh, that is still based in Fiji and that collaborated in, uh, in the world today. So 
it will be my pleasure to present uh, you the major findings of this research program from three different projects. It's not the whole picture yet because some of the data are still being analyzed. Uh, Kirsten is just about to complete her field work at the moment on bull sharks and she's been working now for two years and a couple of months. Uh, one more month and then all field work will be done and most of the data collection will be done but she's writing up and I will only present part of her findings and part of the findings of the other project. But we have made a substantial progress and I hope that uh, you will appreciate from this talk the importance of coastal sharks in the ecology and the welfare of nature in Fiji and also for uh, humans. Right, so uh, before I get into the actual talk, I'd like to show you a video was, that was produced uh, by one of the people that came with projects abroad to make a program for the BBC. And he kindly, uh, he, he's a journalist, and sent us an edition of that uh, uh, program for the BBC that I'd like to share with you to begin with in order to set up the environment where we are working and what involved it at the time. This was done uh, back in uh, 1915. Yeah, end of 1914, uh, beginning of, 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 of uh, 1915. So if we can switch now to the, to the video, and I will sit uh, down as well to watch the video. It's only two, 10 minutes. Then after that, I will go into the uh, presentation itself. 2014, year tagging sharks in nearby Navua River, although figures have shown that this once thriving shark nursery has not much left to offer. In the space of 12 months, only seven sharks have been caught and tagged. period and once again the team has come up empty-handed. It was time to come up with a new location to survey. The project has teamed up with marine biologist Celso Kowicz and Professor Ciro Rico from the University of the South Pacific. They'll be learning about the scalloped hammerhead as a species as well as looking at local ecological knowledge that has suggested there could be a scalloped hammerhead nursery in nearby Villanuku. The team from the University of the South Pacific have already identified what appears to be a very abundant hammerhead nursery in the capital Suva, but are also keen to identify other nursery areas. The 
during my first semester, I, I was very fortunate to meet my supervisor, now Professor Ciro Rico, and we started discussing some of the priorities for the Pacific, and there came the rise of the topic of hammerheads. Hammerheads last year uh, were declared an Appendix 2 species under CITES, and we said importance. We started learning about them from a previous USP student, and then that's when we got the idea to start doing some work very nearby to SUA regarding hammerheads. After we reviewed the work that this past student did, we knew that there was a lot of work to be done right there. From his six uh, months of work, it was basically in one night that he got almost all his samples, all his, all his skull of hammerheads. For you to be able to capture 80 something hammer, hammerheads in one night, that means that there is something going on in that area. We also got in communication with the local fishermen and we started digging a little bit further and that's where we are right now. So far we've carried out five months of uh, work and we have some 500 sharks to present. The following week, a team from the University of the South Pacific invite us to join their research boat in the Rewal River. the jackpot in terms of finding where the nursery areas are with the collaboration of local fishermen who has been uh, fishing those areas for generations uh, we know exactly where to go and we have very uh, good catch rates every night that we go out at sea at the moment I think we are already in the order of 500 uh, juvenile hammerhead sharks uh, samples in only six months of work by the end of the first year, I, I, I reckon that we will have at least a thousand samples. So that will be very useful to determine the minimum number of females that come into the area. Uh, but my major goal will be to maintain a monitoring program over time to see how that fluctuates year after year and whether uh, the bycatch from the, uh, local fishermen is affecting the population in any way. But with the, cur the current data, we will certainly be able to have very clear questions and very clear answers to seek for extra funding. The conservation of the species is what the stakeholders, is what the community gives it, the value. We have to be honest and say that Pretty much everything has to be given a value in order for us to value it. Now, for us to know what we have first, we need to go and do the science. What I, what I would wish would happen would be that the communities of Fiji, the people of Fiji, the government of Fiji are able to give it a value. Something that is, that is really valuable to Fiji, not only as an ecosystem species, but as an iconic species. It's a scallop hammerhead. Many people are in awe when they see a scallop hammerhead for the first time in the waters. I guess the big dream is to try to establish marine protected areas for these species. If we could put one example such as the Rewa River Estuary as a nursery area, we could get other people, other uh, organizations, the Fiji government interested in, in well, we found one nursery in Fiji, there might be more. Let's go out, let's start asking questions, let's start investigating. At least, let's do that. This might bring up to maybe there's only one nursery here, maybe there are many, many more, maybe there are many other nurseries for other species. But we need to start looking. We need to start looking in order to find answers, in order to try to put management strategies for these species. 
ultimately, if we do find them, once we stumble upon them, I guess it is up to us to try to manage them. We have been blessed with many, many resources. The people of Fiji have been blessed with many, many resources. If you know what you have, then I guess the least that can be expected from you is to manage them. To influence policy in any country, not only in Fiji, is very difficult. But if you can show the importance of uh, a particular uh, geographical area in the reproduction and uh, survival of a species, then influence policy becomes easier. And uh, my main goal will be to be able to collect sufficient data that demonstrate that the nursery areas for sharks in Fiji are fundamental to their survival. But we can at least reduce the fishing mortality altogether in the nursery areas. I think we will be making a major uh, step towards the conservation of these species, not only in Fiji, but globally. Yes, you can hear me, yes, that's working. Can we have the slides back, please? Right, well, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of Matthew Frost, the uh, journalist who made this film possible a while ago. Uh, Tom Vieros, who is with us uh, to, today, this evening, and responsible for the project in Ba, uh, is also a cameraman, but unfortunately he was very busy to give us some of the uh, films that he shot at, at, uh, when he was doing his master's degree. But we have quite a few good pictures in the presentation. So, getting on with the actual project. Um, in the next 40 minutes, basically, while I deliver this talk, at least 600 sharks will die around the world due to overfishing, habitat destruction, pollution, and other forms of human-induced disturbances into the shark, into the marine environment. So that is the equivalent of one shark every three seconds. And that is appalling, and it's happening right now. It has been documented scientifically. The uh, amount of sharks that are landed every year at different ports around the world, mostly for their fins, is tremendous is in the order of 100 million tons per year. And that's because of our greed, because we don't really need sharks in, our, in the food uh, chain for humans. Honestly, we can live on other fishes. But there are certain cultures that regard shark fins as an extremely valuable and luxury item and pay up to 5,000 US dollars per kilogram of fins in markets such as uh, the uh, Hong Kong market. So we have to do something about it. And, sorry, wrong. It's not only for sharks. Most fish stocks are known to be already fully exploited or overexploited. And what I present in this uh, slide is the estimated biomass in the North Atlantic at the turn of the 20th century and then at the turn of the 21st century. And uh, this uh, heat uh, diagram, the uh, rather the color, the more the quantity of biomass distributions of high trophic level fishes in these areas. So as you can see, at the turn of the uh, 20th century, uh, all this part in the North Atlantic had at least 11 uh, tons per square kilometer of uh, top-level fishes, top-level predatory fishes. So that's cod, sharks, you name it. A uh, hundred years later, it has dropped to 
less than four tons per square uh, kilometer in certain areas, and in other areas it has completely disappeared. And the decline continues to be the same all over the world. So we have to do something about it. We cannot continue with those levels of uh, unsustainable fishing in our oceans, because if we, if we do, our children and our children's children are unlikely to ever taste a wild-caught fish. Right. Among those fishes that are extremely vulnerable, sharks are probably the most vulnerable fishes in the world. And that's because of three main characteristics. First of all, because of late age of maturity. That means that they don't become reproductively viable or mature to breed until they have anything between two to 150 years of age. And believe me, you will be very surprised with that. I'll show you more in a minute. Um, they have very low fecundity, so they are key strategies, meaning that instead of producing a large number of eggs, they produce a small number of fully formed offspring when they are viviparous. Some species have true placentas and are viviparous. Other species do produce eggs, but they produce large eggs instead of hundreds of small ones. Uh, so their fecundity is, 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 is relatively small. And they have a very long lifespan. Uh, in the order of 20, 30, depending on the species. But surprisingly enough, in August 2016, a group of researchers from the University of Norway published in the journal Science, which is one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world, probably the second most prestigious, a paper that documented that the uh, Greenland shark, a particular species uh, living in, in, in the uh, Arctic waters, can live up to 500 years believe it or not. And they use uh, radiocarbon uh, dating to reveal the age of the species from the lenses of their eye. And by using different radiocarbon dating techniques, and in particularly by using the signature of the atomic bomb test that the US carried in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, and the Russia as well, in the 1950s, they were able to uh, determine the age of certain sharks that have grown since the 1950s up to date, and from that, estimate the curve of the different sharks. Sh uh, sorry. Um, just pushing the wrong button. Uh, so this curve is the growth curve. Uh, so a shark that measures five meters, 500 centimeters, is estimated to have an age anything with a confidence interval between at least 300 years up to 500 years. And these guys actually do not mature sexually until they are 150 years old. Can you imagine having sex for the first time at 150 years and being a child for about 70 years and then being a teenager for another 70 years? It must be horrible. Well, <laughs> sharks are adapted to that. So you can see how vulnerable they are. It takes a long time to produce them. This is an extreme. But there are many other deep uh, water uh, shark species that we have no clue of how long they take uh, to grow, to sexually mature, and how long they survive. We know a little bit about coastal shark species, and that's what we are going to concentrate from now on. Right, so identifying critical habitats for shark reproduction and conservation is fundamental in order to establish management and conservation policies for these areas. We know that coastal sharks use uh, natural embayments, estuaries, river mouths for uh, parturition, for growth, and for maturation. And those areas are called nursery areas. We knew from previous studies conducted also by USP, uh, by one of our uh, former master's students, Kelly Brown, who currently works in the school as uh, the curator of our collection, um, he documented for the first time in the Regua River with scientific data that that was an area of aggregation for scallop hammerhead sharks. But he wasn't able to conduct a project throughout the year, so we set up this project in order to determine whether that um, particular area was indeed a nursery ground or not. But let me first introduce the species. The scallop hammerhead shark 
is a circumglobally distributed species that occurs in temperate and tropical, coastal and pelagic and semi-oceanic environments. So it's mostly coastal. The red color uh, signals areas of abundance. The redder the color, the more they are. And as you can see, they do not occur in open water. They are always associated to the continental shelf. Adults, although they are semi-pelagic, they move just a little bit away from the continental shelf, but tend to return always to the coast during the breeding season for parturition. They give birth to the pups always in enclosed basements, and those are the ones that are called nursery areas. So, um, juveniles are also demersal, so they feed from uh, the bottom of the ocean, mainly from uh, crustacean species, but also from uh, few species, and, and they use these coast, coastal areas as nursery. Adults are primarily pelagic and solitary. They only come to the coast during the breeding season. So, knowing that the Regua Delta was likely to be an important nursery area for Fiji, and also the Ba Estuary, we wanted to test the hypothesis whether that was a truly nursery area. And in order to test that from a scientific perspective, we needed to test three different predictions. The first prediction tells us that there should be a significantly higher number of juveniles in the nursing area than in the surrounding areas. The second prediction is that there, sh there should be clear site fidelity of neonates and young of the years to that particular so-called nursery area. And third, that there is also evidence of long-term presence of juveniles in that particular area. Uh, with Kelly's study, we were only able to document an aggregation there, but we couldn't actually be sure if everything else corresponds to the definitions of a nursery area. So in order to answer that question, we set up uh, a research project that, uh, conducted, uh, that was conducted from September 2014 to uh, March 2016, so over 18 months, by uh, setting up gillnet at least 40 hours per week during the night, from sunset to about midnight. Um, the gillnet was 100 meters length by 3 meters uh, height, and we have to uh, check the net every 15 to 20 minutes to prevent sharks from drawing. Sharks don't have the opercular muscles that other uh, fish species have, that helps them to pump water through their gills, and therefore they have to move in order to breed. So if they are caught in a gill net, they will die within 20 minutes of being caught. So we have to be very careful as well for that. Then we decided our focal area. We knew from Kelly's uh, preliminary study that this part of the Regua Delta, just coming out of the inflow of the Regua River, was the area with the highest number of scale of, uh, juvenile scale of hammerhead sharks. But we have to run an initial pilot study. Sorry, again, bottom. get lost with these. I need another PhD to learn how to manage these things. <laughs> right, so we set up a, a number of focal points following a pilot study. And that pilot study was very important because we needed to know where we can sample on a regular basis. The area is influenced by uh, the uh, current of the outcoming of the Regua uh, River, which sometimes with heavy rain, you can imagine how strong that can be. In the first week of the pilot study, we lost a net because we put it in the, right, in the wrong position and the Regua just took it away from us. Who knows where that net ended up? Uh, so, after that pilot study, we established seven points for regular monitoring, where we regularly caught sharks, and also that were sufficiently sheltered from uh, the tidal currents and from the river flow currents. Once a shark was caught, as you saw in the film, we have to measure the shark, sex the shark, determine whether it was female or, uh, or, or male. Uh, we also uh, put a... a measure the shark, and we also put a uh, pit tag, that is a, a passive 
uh, transponder, uh, integrated transponder. That is a microchip that emits uh, a signal that can be captured with a receiver and that tells us whether that shark has already been uh, tagged. And, and the signal that is emitted produces a number. It's the same one that we use for dogs, for marking dogs or any sort of wild animals. Um, following that, we uh, took uh, a small biopsy sample from uh, the pelvic fin in order to conduct DNA analysis later on and determine kinship relationships among the shark captured in the Rewa Delta and also to determine how different these shark populations are from other shark populations around the Pacific. Uh, after following uh, all those procedures, most of the sharks, once they were tagged, were released back into the ocean. Um, we have a few casualties, unfortunately, but unfortunately, uh, only a very few compared to the number of sharks that we were able to capture. So, in the lapse of uh, six, 18 months, we were able to uh, obtain 1,217 uh, shark captures, scallop hammer sex shark, from the time that I stayed. From those, uh, a total of 952 were individual sharks plus 101 recaptures. And we were able to establish the recapture, remember, because of the pit tag. Um, an additional 163 sharks were captured by local fishermen as bycatch, and they were given to us for DNA analysis as well. Um, so the first question, do you remember, of the first prediction that we wanted to test was to find out whether there is a greater abundance of sharks in what we call a nursery area than it is surrounding area. And in this uh, map, what I show is the relative proportion of sharks caught at the different sites, but the diameter of the circle. And as you can see, these areas has almost no sharks, only a few, while these areas have the largest number of sharks. We also conducted uh, pilot work uh, uh, on the east side of Laudala Island and found no sharks at all. So that confirmed the first of the prediction. Yes, there is a significantly higher abundance of sharks in what we think is the nursery area than in the surrounding uh, areas. The, the second part was that there is clear site fidelity of neonates and young of the years to the nursery. And for that, we use the recapture data. So from the 796 uh, sharks that we managed to tag and release alive, 101 were recaptured during our field services. Some of them were recaptured more than once, one of them up to five times. And uh, the recapture time ranged before one day, so day after was caught for the first time, up to 174 days. So that result alone suggests that indeed there is site fidelity. However, this is a question that still remains to be fully confirmed with radio tagging and using transmitters. Because the fact that we recapture the sharks doesn't mean that they have remained there throughout that period and that they are growing in that area. They, move, they can move out and in to surrounding areas. But so far, we haven't had enough financial resources to go that far. So hopefully, in the future, we will have more financial resources to continue and fully address this second uh, part. Another line of evidence that suggests that these sharks are there throughout the year is the actual catch per unit effort throughout the uh, sample period. So from September 14, which is here, to March 2016. And uh, the boxes basically say the minimum and maximum number of sharks caught at any given time, the standard deviation, and the black bar is the mean of that. The outlier points is the, the highest number of sharks that were ever caught at a particular period during that month. The important thing from this graph is that they are there throughout the year, and they peak during the austral uh, summer, so between December and March in 2015, and again, between February and March in 2016, when we stopped the work. 
Um, in February 2016, we didn't catch much, uh, not because they were not charged dead, but remember we have Cyclone Winston hitting uh, Fiji, and therefore we could establish very little work. In January 2015, we don't have any data because there was a sewage spillage at the Cunningham Creek in December 2015, and the government established a complete ban of fishing in all the areas. So no fishing was allowed, not even for research. Uh, and that's why we don't have data. But basically, we can confidently say that sharks are there throughout the year. We also were able to establish the land distribution of the sharks, and so that most of the sharks that we caught are between 50 and uh, 57 centimeters, uh, with meaning that they are newly born sharks young of the year. But there are a few more that are bigger than that. Our rates, uh, we estimated the rates of growth at nine centimeters per year based on the recapture rates. And therefore, these sharks here are at least one year old and up to this one here, which is at least three years old. Uh, this little point here was a female shark capture that measured 117 centimeters. Uh, the different color bars is basically males and females. In terms of uh, the uh, umbilical scar condition, which is another of the data that we take, remember these guys are placental, so they have an umbilical scar just like us. Uh, when they are newly born, that is open, as it can be appreciated in that picture. So here is color coded, open for orange, semi-healed, that is about two weeks after, uh, cap uh, after being born, and then completely healed, you can still see the scar, but it's closed. And then well healed is when you don't see it anymore. And this graph basically represents the uh, umbilical scar conditions of all the sharks captured. So as you can see, open umbilical scar are only present, again, during the austral summer or at the uh, uh, end of the uh, autumn in both years. Uh, healed are more abundant as the season increases and semi healed are decreased as well as the season uh, moves. So with that data, we were able to unambiguously demonstrate that the parturition season in the Regua Delta and probably in the entire region is during the austral summer, which corresponds to other nursery areas in the northern hemisphere, which corresponds to the uh, boreal summer. So June, July, August, that has been documented in Hawaii. So very similar. So that is the most critical time of the year where we have to protect these uh, sharks. So um, our recommendations out of this, uh, the results of this project are uh, several, but basically we need to seek an agreement where we can fulfill the needs for resources from the people that was livelihood depend on the Regua Delta for fishing and the conservation necessities for the survival of the species. And that is obviously a very difficult ground. Uh, the chiefs of the Regua Delta has declared the uh, Regua Delta as an MPA last year, but the parliament, as far as I am aware, is presently discussing protecting the area completely by law that will need to be enforced, and hopefully this year uh, that, uh, those laws will be put into place. But our recommendations in order of importance for the Regua Delta are as follows, and they are given in order of importance for the conservation of the species, and at the same time, by fulfilling their, uh, need, the need for uh, natural resources and, and fish resources from that area. So first of all, will be a complete ban of gill net fishing. And gill net is the, the key to this because gill nets will kill all sharks that fall. If you use hook and line, it's different. You can release sharks that you capture with almost no damage, and you can keep every other fish. Um, if that is still difficult, this at least a partial ban of uh, gill net during, uh, from sunrise to sunset which is the time where sharks are most active. But if those two options still are uh, unacceptable to the communities, we recommend to at least protect the area from gillnet fishing 
throughout the parturition season. Either the whole parturition season, which is estimated from October to March, or at least during the peak of the parturition season, so from December to March. Right, and that brings me to the uh, next project. Well, this is just a picture of the uh, scientific paper that was published last December uh, reporting all these findings. Uh, it was published in Scientific Report, which is one of the nature publishing group journals, and it's open access, so anyone can just download it. Uh, if you don't know how to find it, just send me an email and I will be pleased to send you a PDF of the paper. The next uh, project as part of this uh, research program that I will be presented involves the biosphere. And that was conducted as part of a master thesis carried out by Tom Bierus, who is with us today, as I said, from Germany, uh, in collaboration with the University of Bremen and with the CEDENT, which is the Leibniz Center for Tropical Ecology also in Bremen. And uh, we also knew that the Ba estuary was an aggregation area for different shark species. And Tom was mainly in interested in finding out what species utilize the Ba estuary and in which way they utilize that part, uh, whether there are any environmental drivers that partition the shark distribution throughout the uh, estuary. And what are the sharks' abundances at the moment and whether they have changed over the past year by conducting interviews with local fishermen and as well by finding out the average species composition in the local markets and how many boats are licensed in that area. So Tom arrived uh, in uh, November uh, 2015 and conducted uh, his master thesis from December 2016 15 to uh, April 2016. He also was here for Cyclone uh, Winston, and we have to stop work there. But the first part of the work was similar to what we did in the Red White, was to establish focal areas for sampling uh, that were uh, sufficiently protected from tidal uh, waves, from tidal currents, and, and also from river flow of the Bar River itself. Uh, the area is, is, is relatively similar to the Regua Delta, also with mangrove forest and uh, reef, uh, in, uh, fringing reef in the outer part of the lagoon, and a relatively shallow lagoon. Some areas are deeper, some areas are very shallow, 20, 30 centimeters during low tide. And within those areas, he uh, established a number of points where, again, the same type of methodology was established, gill netting uh, during the night, also soak for uh, anything between one hour and three hours and check every 10 to 15 minutes. But in addition to that, Tom also decided to use long lines of uh, 75 meters with baited hooks, with live bait. And that proved to be very effective for capturing certain type of shark. Um, he also conducted interviews with fishermen in the area in order to, first of all, find from local traditional and ecological knowledge which shark species they have seen in that area, whether they have seen changes in abundance and the species composition over time, and uh, where do the, the fishermen mainly fish and the obvious catches of shark, and also the utilization of shark, whether that was for uh, fulfilling their own uh, food needs or for selling into the local market. In addition to that, he conducted regular market servers to find out which shark species were present in the, in the market. And these pictures are from the uh, market in Bau, where you can see bundles of hammerhead sharks uh, and also bundles of uh, black tip sharks. So how many species were there? And from the fisheries department to find out the number of licenses that were given in the Botua and Golengoli to try to estimate the levels of fishing pressure. In terms of result for uh, Tom's work, what he found is that the catch per unit effort, that is one hour of uh, uh, unit effort for gill net or for long lines, changed from the, uh, sorry, varied from different areas in the uh, estuary. Some areas have higher proportion of captures with the gill net that is the blue color uh, bars, 
and some others have a higher proportion of long line uh, capture. That is the uh, orange uh, bar. So significantly difference there. Uh, furthermore, he also found differences in the species composition. This is again color coded. For gray is the uh, black tip shark, the white is the scallop hammerhead shark, and the black is the great, uh, halop, uh, the, the great uh, hammerhead shark. So three species of shark. The species composition quite different between different areas and also shark abundance quite different from different areas. Uh, he also was able to establish the land distribution of the sharks for the period sampled, which was similar for the skull of hammerhead shark of what we observe, but obviously on a much shorter period. Uh, also for black tip sharks and for the great hammerhead sharks, which are the bigger of the three species here, measuring between 70 up to 85 centimeters. In terms of umbilical scar condition, he was able to determine that the parturition season for the black tip shark is earlier than from the hammerhead shark because the highest number of open umbilical scars were found in December, while the highest number for the skull of hammerhead shark was found in February. Um, and um, I, as, as I said, I can only give you uh, a, a summary of the results. I cannot go into the details given the time constraints. And, but I'm going to switch now to the third project that is currently being conducted by uh, Kerstin Glaus. Kerstin is uh, concentrating on bull sharks. And bull sharks have similar, species, similar uh, life history characteristics as hammerhead sharks in terms of they are also uh, apex predators and they also have low fecundity and so on. But the most important thing about bull sharks in Fiji is that they are an iconic species and extremely important for the shark diving industry. Uh, the shark diving industry in Fiji, all the big operators concentrate on bull sharks. If you go to Benga a la Lagoon any Saturday, you can just jump in one of the boats of the two companies that are operating there, Venga Adventure Divers, that is co co collaborating with us, or with Aquatrek, which is the other company. And the shark diving industry brings about $40 million a year to the country. So an important species for that, and an important species for conservation again. But the first question uh, Kirsten was interested to, to address was whether the Fijian shark population is genetically different from other shark populations in the Indo-Pacific. And that came from the fact that a previous analysis that was never published but presented by some collaborators in a conference showed that the Fijian uh, population was distinct from other uh, shark populations across the world and in particularly in the Indo-Pacific. But the results were not conclusive because it involved only a small number of genetic markers that allowed them uh, to uh, address this particular question. So what we did is to collect a much larger number of uh, genetic markers. So we took the signature of nearly 3,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms. That's changes in the DNA sequence at a single site. And using the combined signature of those polymorphic sites, Kirsten was able to demonstrate that samples collected from uh, South Africa, from Indonesia, and from the west coast of Australia, as well as from the east coast of Australia, and obviously from Fiji, were genetically differentiated from one another. And what you see in this graph, which is a principal component graph, but ignore that, uh, what I'm trying to concentrate here is that Every circle here represents the DNA signature of a single shark using this marker, right? And then that genetic signature, uh, because it's co the combined signature of 3,000 different polymorphic sites in the DNA, can be combined and can be uh, analyzed in this principal component analysis. And what that is telling us is that all the samples collected in the Indo-Pacific, with the exception of Fiji, which is the blue-colored ones, 
sit in a cluster somewhere here. So they are much more similar to one another, although there is some differentiation between the eastern Australian coast, that uh, reddish color, and uh, South Africa, that yellow color down here. But as you can see, Fijian sharks are quite different from them. So yes, the bull shark population of Fiji is unique. It's genetically differentiated and probably geographically isolated from other such populations. And in terms of conservation, what this means is that if we overexploit bull shark populations or we deplete those populations, it might be very difficult to replace them because naturally sharks, bull sharks, will not swim across open ocean. These are coastal species. They also use rivers for parturition and for nursery areas. Bull sharks are uraline species. That means they tolerate fresh water and marine water. There are even some populations in the world, like in Lake Nicaragua, where bull sharks live their entire life in a freshwater lake, right? So in Fiji, we know that bull sharks utilize the Rewa River. So the conclusions from the uh, genetic analysis are there in writing, but I already said them, and I'm not going to stop anymore. So Kirsten has been also extremely busy collecting data for the Rewa River, for the Nabua River, for the Singatoka River, and also for the uh, River, for her bull sharks. Here is Kirsten releasing a bull shark after being uh, captured, uh, tagged, measured, and etc. So she has used basically the same type of uh, methodology. She has to sex the shark, and it is an opportunity to show a male compared to the female that doesn't have these claspers here, uh, and also determine whether the umbilical scar is open or healed. Here is a good picture to show that. And from March uh, 2016 to uh, this December, beginning of December uh, 2016, she caught zero sharks after at least four days going every night catching her sharks in the uh, Rewa River. So a huge effort, no sharks at all. So we were very disappointed. We thought that the nursery has disappeared because probably of habitat uh, destruction of, of, of different disturbances or simply because sharks don't use that area anymore like in the Nabua. The picture, uh, the, the film that we showed at the beginning was from the Nabua and over seven months they caught seven sharks. So very low catches. But bingo, came December 6, 2000, 2016 and uh, with that came Christmas and her Christmas gift was a bunch of sharks right in December, and then a few more in January, February, and March. So uh, by the end of March 2017, she has caught a total of 80 uh, bull sharks in that area and have identified two hot spots where they concentrate in the Regua River. But we didn't repeat the sampling from March to December. We knew it was probably spotless and it was just a not good use of the resources. We will not find sharks in that time. But she began again sampling in December 2015. And by today we have, what, 104? That's it, 104 sharks caught. In this case, one hot spot for, for them. She has also measured environmental parameters and is aiming to uh, establish whether the distribution of the sharks are related to any environmental cues very similar to what Tom did in the Bar River, but I didn't have time to present all that data. Another important outcome from here that I'm not going to present data because it will be very complicated, but I briefly tell you is the kinship analysis, the DNA analysis. With the samples that we caught, we were able to establish kinship among all the pairs of shark caught. Not in, for the hammerheads, we have more than a thousand samples, so we didn't have money to do that many. But we analyzed 166 uh, hammerhead uh, shark, and from those we were able to determine that at least 88 males and at least 89 females have taken part in producing that cohort of 166. So the number of families uh, that we found, full brothers, full sieves, and half sieves, allows to determine 
the minimum number of males and females that are using the Rewa Delta. And if we can uh, extrapolate that to the total number of sharks that we're catching, we know that those areas are used by at least 500 different males and females in that area. And the same is true for bull sharks. And we are even uh, or, uh, able to determine parentage with samples that have been uh, caught at the Shark Reef Marine Reserve by Bay Adventure Divers. So we can establish the father and the mother of some of these little sharks uh, by taking samples from adult sharks in another area. So to complete uh, my talk today, I'm just going to talk about another component of uh, Kirsten's thesis, and that is uh, a survey of uh, sharks caught in Fiji waters that she conducted as part of her master thesis in 2013, published in 2015. She found at that time that about 15% uh, of fishermen do target sharks. Uh, about 70%, so the vast majority of the sharks that are caught in the fishing industry is as bycatch, and a proportion of fishermen also in the order of 15% uh, are uh, non, uh, have never caught a shark. That was done in 2015, and she wanted to repeat that, but in a more wider scale within the Fiji Islands. So the uh, diameter of the circles here represent the number of interviews that she has conducted in different villages around uh, Viti Levu, the Yasawas, the Mamanudas, uh, Vanua Levu, and Tabeuni, uh, also in Kandavu. The results so far show that shark catches have decreased since 2013. And that's very good news. And that's probably due to the ban on uh, shark finning that the government imposed in 2015 when these sharks became uh, appendix two of, of, of CITES. So the work is, 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 seems to be uh, effective in terms of conservation. Many more questions remain to be addressed and we are very eager to continue that. Kirsten's thesis is being written up as I said now and uh, still ongoing with analysis and many things will be uh, discover soon and hopefully next year uh, with all these results we will be able to determine what are the next steps and acquire more funding to continue with these research programs. So thank you very much for your attention tonight and uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have. <laughs> Sorry, I nearly forgot acknowledgements, project team all the people involved from uh, students, postdocs, uh, to volunteers from uh, projects abroad, from TIER, faculty members as well involved. I did recognize them uh, in the authorship for the main research, but it's also fair to recognize the contribution of people that are not in the authorship, but that have helped us a lot. De Diego Cardenosa, Gautier Mescam, Brittany Waters from the, these volunteer companies. Uh, and also our boat captains uh, from uh, the School of Marine Study and also from outside uh, the school, Semi and Inoki and Angatalebru, a fisherman from the Rewa River, Timosi, Ramesh, Prasad, and the late Netani, Tulele, Tevita, and Sione, who helped Tom in the Bar River. And I don't have the names of uh, the fishermen that Kirsten uh, is uh, having helped in, 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 in the Delta. But I can introduce you uh, for the refreshment to uh, Kirsten and Tom, who are uh, fortunately here with us and can probably answer better, better than me many of the questions that you may have. Thank you very much now. <laughs> Have uni, I understand uh, that there's a, uh, a tourist attraction which you can see schooling hammer hammerheads. Yes, is that the different species? It's the same as the skull of hammerhead. They they school at certain times of the year, but they move primarily with the thermoclines. It's not that easy to see them at a, at a depth 
that uh, scuba diving or snorkeling allows you to reach. So it depends on the season and depends on the, where the thermocline is found. They tend to be at 60 meters and below, so very difficult to reach with uh, scuba. But sometimes of the year you can. So yes, when they found it, they, they reported there's, I mean, Tabuni is one of them, but uh, schooling scale of hammerhead sharks are found throughout the Pacific. Galapagos is another important area, and Baja California in Mexico is another important area for that. Right. <coughs> we don't seem to see them uh, during the, uh, uh, the shark dive there in Benga. Is that just because they're not? No, uh, no. Uh, they come for different reasons. I mean, it's, it's at, at least here in Fiji, it's not easy to attract the scale of hammerhead shark, bark shark, uh, beating by shark, um, feeding. Uh, remember that in Benga, the attraction comes from uh, the fact that they feed the sharks, so yes, they are right. provisioning uh, sites. Um, there is a study by one of our collaborators, Lucian Weller, uh, back in, the, in 20, 2010, I think, or 2011, where he documented over a number of years the species composition of the Benga Adventure Dive, the Shark Marine Reserve, operated by Benga Adventure Diver. And it's clear that when they be gone, they have many more shark species than they have now. It seems that it, all the species have been competitively excluded by bull sharks. They just don't allow mm. other species to come there. And that is also due to the way they feed the shark. They only drop one head of tuna at the time, or feed by hand one head of tuna at the time. Aquatrek has a different operation. They just chomp uh, pieces of fish all over the place from the top, and that is a complete mess of uh, shark species. Bulls are there, but you have nurse sharks at the bottom, you have uh, gray sharks as well, you have uh, silver tips, also just dashing from the, from the water column into the bomb. You have lots of trevally, lots of big grouper. It, it's it's yes. completely different, the setting, just like the way they uh, feed. But hammerhead sharks are not seen there. They have been reported at uh, provisioning sites in, in the Caribbean, gray hammerhead shark. Right. Yes. Okay, thank you. Here, Nadine. Yes. Could you just, um, I'm just wondering, I know that uh, it's been seen that the bull sharks actually go up the river. And this tagging scheme seems to have shown that the hammerheads are staying in the estuary. Have there been any records of the hammerheads actually going up river or within the mangroves? Not from our study. Um, there, there are some uh, anecdotal uh, accounts of, of, of seeing hammerheads up the river. That must be adults. Yeah. Uh, scale of hammerhead juveniles are pretty much intolerant to fresh water. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, one, one day that we were sampling there uh, after heavy rain, uh, we made a mistake to put water in the tank from the surface, and that was pretty much fresh water. And when we put the shark in, it instantly died because of the fresh water. Then we bought a pump and then pumped all, always the water from three meters below to make sure that it was all water. So no, they don't tolerate uh, salinities below 27 parts per thousand. So it's unlikely. Perhaps some adults will be more tolerant because of uh, physiological resistance, but juveniles are not. Mm -hmm. They were always restricted to the, to the delta itself. And as you saw from the picture, also to the left-hand side of the main uh, water uh, current, yeah. the, main, uh, the main flow of the river. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm just curious about the international price for shark fin. So do bull sharks and hammerheads have a high price on the international shark fins, I mean, on the markets? Thank you. Ah, okay, for the, 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 I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you mean uh, how much is worth a live shark on the shark feeding industry compared to the fishing? 
Ah, the fin. Okay, the fin. For bull sharks, it won't be uh, that high. The, the, uh, the highest value of fin shark is for um, scale of hammerheads, gray hammerheads, which are huge, huge uh, uh, dorsal fins and, and, and pelvic fins. Uh, those are the highest prices. I have seen it in, in Hong Kong for 5,000 euros a kg. Uh, bull sharks, I don't know, it's much smaller. All uh, shark fins are highly priced, but I have seen prices ranging from 700 to 5,000 dollars. So it's still expensive, but difficult just by looking in the um, display uh, of the shops, it's difficult to determine which species is there unless you are an expert on shark taxonomy, which I am not. I'm Can we have uh, the microphone from the gentleman here? Uh, hi, I'm uh, Felipe Tiso from uh, one of the traditional Ngolingoli owners from uh, Rio province. Eh? Right. So it was quite, uh, I saw your advertisement, I came from the village to hear the presentation. Thank you very much. So That's it was quite uh, interesting. I was wondering, uh, you showed that uh, map on, uh, you know, the areas of concentration. Yes. Or uh, what was that term you used? But it seems from the map that uh, that's uh, in front of Matei Suba Beach. Eh? Am yes. I correct? Or? Yes, yes, you are correct. Yes, okay. I'll, I'll, so I can put that. Uh, I was wondering, uh, because that's an area with uh, quite uh, high waves and uh, strong currents. I was, I was wondering how, uh, Sorry. you know, that area is a nursery. I'm just a question. Well, I mean, yes. Uh, they don't seem to, to mind that. Uh, we were able to sample in those areas during certain times of the night. So not, not all the time, but yes, I mean, well, yeah, we have to face big swallows, uh, big swallows every, every night, especially coming out of the channel, uh, and especially after heavy rain. But yes, I mean, the sharks will be, especially uh, scale of hammerhead sharks, will be at the bottom, will be always close to the bottom. So the waves won't have so much effect on their distribution. Fresh water has, as you saw also in the map, that the main stream of uh, uh, fresh water current from the Regua River does indeed have an effect on the distribution of the sharks. But the closer you are to the beach, the higher the boundary. Yes, and uh, the other issue uh, you mentioned was on the, you know, the recommendations. Eh? Yes. There was, uh, I know that uh, a few months, I think two months ago, three months, the, uh, there was a declaration of uh, for marine protected area. From the chiefs, but, yes. Uh, yes, I mentioned Golingoli owner, but uh, owner is uh, sort of a term uh, which is still to be clarified. Eh? Right. Because uh, the state is the owner of all the rivers eh? at the moment. So whether that declaration is legally uh, recognized or enforceable, we need is a declaration by the Ngolingoli. Yes. Custodians, which I would use instead of owners, is something which is questionable. The other issues I thought I'd uh, raise, you know, right now, uh, I was, uh, there was a presentation by the ministry at uh, our provincial council meeting. They mentioned dredging and sand extraction as major threats. And if you go along the river now, there's about four or five uh, sand extraction operations right now. And uh, not only that, but also upriver gravel. And uh, not only they are doing it, but now it has gone on at an increased rate. Eh? It has uh, intensified. And uh, you would see if you go towards Nosori, there's huge amounts of uh, sand coming out from Wainibokasi. And that's from the Rio River. Yeah. And not only are they using huge trucks, 10 and 12 wheelers, uh, it, the intensity and the the amount of sand being extracted has increased. I don't know why. Maybe because uh, the election is uh, coming and there might be a change in the policies. But uh, apart from that, uh, you know, there's a huge threat too from dumping, regular dumping, fishing and uh, mangrove destruction eh, in terms of the issuing of mangrove licenses. So yeah. that's uh, a few of the issues I thought I'd uh, share today. But uh, in terms of the recommendations, you know, it's, uh, it's good 
but uh, the question is uh, in terms of uh, coordination with the different government departments. Absolutely. And I suppose uh, advocacy. Uh, and enforcing. With, uh, enforcing. with uh, you know, people who, uh, who will be making decisions, and uh, those people are the politicians. Eh? And either the current government or the next government, that's, uh, I suppose, the reality of the situation. And the other piece of information, uh, last week we just signed an agreement for a new road, which is, will go through the mangroves, but it's for the concern of the Matangal, it's for the road to go through across from Nasali Landing, which will cross the river, and up to uh, Wuchia, which you, you might know, yes. which is a village at the mouth of the river. So I don't know about the environmental impact assessment of that, and uh, whether you guys are aware of that, but yeah, uh, I mean, what, what yeah. I've shared with the provincial council is that that road must be in line with a sustainable development plan to be within that eh? and yeah. also taking into account what's been presented yeah. today. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, that input. Um, several things here, and perhaps Helen can help me as well with that environmental impact assessment that, that was distributed and uh, commented among us a few months ago, is that the same thing, isn't it? This, this is in addition to that? This is in addition. Well, um, okay. uh, so there, there are four different road extensions being done by FRA in the general Tailevu mangrove area. One of them I know of has had an EIA done and the other three have gone a bit quiet, so I'm not certain. Right. But the IA we were discussing was not one of the road ones. These are separate. Right. The other one is the river, the Mangrove Association Development. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. That. yes. yes. Yeah. Well. So you guys have come directly to the chief to uh, lobby for that. And uh, what, I know, what I know is they have come uh, with the usual things, you know, yes. to influence. Thank you. I, I was uh, able to read the environmental impact assessment of what Helen just mentioned, and it, it was extremely poorly done. We criticized it heavily, yeah. and it, it obviously uh, the person who was responsible for that has no clue of what he was talking about. Uh, let me go back right to at the beginning of the talk, and when I presented the, the video there, uh, I said that influence policy is extremely difficult because it involves a large number of stakeholders. In this case, you are mentioning the owners of the Ngolingoli, the fishermen, the families whose life, uh, livelihoods depend on fishing on these areas, and those things have to be taken into consideration, number one. But for instance, dragging, will not benefit any of those. I mean, it will not benefit any fish species. It will just simply destroy the environment together for the people who depend on that and for the animals and plants and the biodiversity that lives there. So uh, dragging and all kind of uh, environmental disturbances of that kind will have a tremendous effect on the livelihood of those people. And also on these uh, wild populations. Uh, our job as scientists is to provide the best scientific data and information to the government so that they can make truly informed decisions. This is not an environmental impact assessment. This is a study carried out with great effort by a number of uh, students and postdocs over an, uh, uh, a number of months to demonstrate the importance for that particular species that is threatened with extinction because of our exploitation and listed in Appendix 2 of Cyprus. So we are given real data to make decisions. But what they end up doing at the end of the day depends on so many things, lobbying on the industry, who is paying for the dragging, who wants the sand, how much that brings to the communities or to certain pockets. Uh, I'm not going to enter into that debate because I might be sacked from the country tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not a Fiji citizen. But my obligation as scientists and the obligation of my students is to provide the best possible data. I mean, uh, Kerstin perhaps can comment on how far you go up the river uh, in, the, in, in, in the Rewa for catching your sharks. 
and the areas where are completely devoid of sharks because of habitat uh, destruction that you have seen, and those that still remain healthy where you're catching most of your sharks. Uh, if you can just at least uh, stand up, people can talk to, to you perhaps after the, uh, during refreshment, Kerstin. Don't be shy. <laughs> I want to introduce you to everybody so that everybody knows who is the uh, first author of the bull shark uh, project, and Tom is the first author of the BA project. So please stand up, guys, so that they know who you are. <laughs> They can comment perhaps more, as I said, of where exactly they are catching the sharks. But yes, uh, if we don't take responsibility as a society and uh, demand from politicians to take care of the environment, the consequences will be paid by the generations to follow. And that is an undeniable fact. If we don't start paying attention now, our children and the children of our children will not see the world the way it is now. And perhaps we'll see some of the species only in aquaria. So unless we do something, what are we going to tell those generations when they will ask us for responsibility? Because is, from my point of view, it's everybody's responsibility to do something. How do we do as normal citizens? We can also lobby where we cast our boat. We have to ask our politicians what is in, the, in, the, in their programs, uh, what are, is the agenda for conservation and for the environment, what they plan to do, and whether we are happy with that. And if we are not happy, we can punish them with uh, our votes by saying we cannot continue prioritizing money and economic growth. Although that is important, it is not the only thing that will make us survive. And yes. I'm going to be stuck tomorrow from the country. <laughs> I'm an, an ecologist. I'm not a politician. No, actually, I hate politics. And I hate conflict, so don't, don't involve me into that. But thank you very much for your contribution. No, I, I'm, I'm very aware of that. And uh, although, as, as, as you say, the chiefs declare that area uh, as a marine protected area, enforcing and actually defining what it is and what it takes is the effort of everyone. They just have to realize the importance from uh, an environmental point of view of protecting it. But obviously, if the government is doing nothing or end up ignoring this, well, what the heck? Carry on, keep fishing until there's nothing left. Right, more questions, comments. I'm very, very, very pleased and thankful for your, for your comments. Yeah, um, when I was uh, just in from uh, British Columbia in 1994, I was with my students and we were doing some CTD and echo sounding river up the Roa River. Right. And the Colombo Bend, it's above Nosari, and it's a very deep hole. And I thought, this is a very distinct echo, really big echo. And I said, well, what could that be? And the student said, well, it could be a shark. And I said, no, nah, sharks don't swim in fresh water. Well, I learned. But it, could that have been a bull shark? Uh, yes, for sure. Bull sharks go into fresh water, 100% proven. Could, How up the river do you catch uh, bull sharks? Uh, approximately seven kilometers. How many? Seven. Seven kilometers of river. In, in low tide? In, yes. In low tide, in so purely fresh water. And there was one report of a bull shark which was caught um, more than 45 kilometers upstream. Five but that was not by our research, it was um, in the newspapers here. And right. that was very far up. Right. Thank you. In, in, in Abua, they also have caught sharks uh, quite up, uh, up the river. Well, if there are no more questions, comments, I think it's just about time for uh, refreshments. Thank you very much again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, 
your presence today at this uh, first presentation of the 50th anniversary of USP. And thank you very much to the research office for not only organizing this today, but also for funding the project in the first place. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Professor Sirico. <laughs> Indeed, I would like to thank Professor Sirico and his team. Uh, in this age when uh, there's climate change and uh, I think the entire world are busy with fake news, are busy with politics. We here in the South Pacific, which is the zero ground for climate change, the effects of climate change and so forth, we are doing our bit via projects, via research projects like the one that Chiru is doing. I hope today, after today's presentation, the world will sit up and really say, look, if Fiji, such a small country like ours, is doing its bit to conserve animals, to conserve the planet, because we don't have planet B, we have only planet A, then they must join us in this fight. And therefore, I would like to thank you, Sir Rico. Uh, that was a great uh, presentation. Uh, the, the, uh, what is so beautiful thing about it is as a Fijian and my colleague there from uh, Rewa, is that we, we are so fortunate that uh, we have our colleagues from all over the world, Christian, and uh, thank you so much to, you know, to bring this, this information to our people, to the plight of our shark. Eh? Uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, as a Fijian, I really appreciate uh, your work. As a South Pacific Islander, I really appreciate your work. And thank you, Sri Riko, for you know, disseminating this news and also helping our young people in the South Pacific um, to know that uh, our environment is important. So with that, I would like, please, to, to, I would like you to join me to thank you once again for your presentation. <laughs> and we have something there to, to have, uh, some tea, I think, coffee. So please enjoy yourself. Thank you.